before beginning this talk, which is concerning the Orthodox worldview, I'd like to say a word on why it is important to have an Orthodox worldview, or rather, why it is more difficult to have one today than it was in past centuries. In past centuries, for example, in Russia in the 19th century, in the early part at least, what we can call an Orthodox worldview was an inseparable part of daily life. It was supported by the life around it. In fact, there was no need really to speak of the separate thing, which was called the Orthodox worldview, because it was simply the same thing as leading an Orthodox life. In many countries, as in Russia, <coughs> the government itself confessed Orthodox religion. It was the center of public functions, and the king, or the ruler himself, was the first Orthodox layman with the responsibility to give a Christian example to all of his subjects. Every city had Orthodox churches. Large cities had many Orthodox churches. Instead of Moscow had 40 times 40, some 1,600 or so churches. Many of these churches had services every day, morning and evening. There were monasteries in all the great cities, in many small cities, outside the cities, and in the countryside, in deserts and wildernesses. In Russia, there were over a thousand monasteries altogether, officially organized monasteries, in addition to other more unofficial groups. And monasticism was an accepted part of life. Most families, in fact, had somewhere in them a sister or a brother, an uncle, a grandfather, a cousin, or someone who was a monk or a nun, in addition to all the other kinds of orthodox uh, examples of orthodox life, people who wandered from monastery to monastery, fools for Christ, and the whole way of life was permeated by orthodox kinds of people, of which, of course, monasticism is the center. Orthodox customs were a part of daily life. Most books that were commonly read were orthodox. And daily life itself was a very difficult thing for most people without modern conveniences. People had to work hard to survive. Life expectancy was not great. Death was a frequent reality. And all of this reinforced the Church's teaching on the other world, which is real and near. And everyone could plainly see how true this was. So living an Orthodox life in such circumstances was really the same thing as having an Orthodox worldview. And there was really no need to talk about such a thing as an Orthodox worldview. Today, on the other hand, all this has changed. It changed very drastically. Our Orthodoxy is a little island in the midst of a world which operates on totally different principles. And every day, these principles are changing for the worse, making us, who are Orthodox Christians, more and more alienated from it. Many people are tempted to divide their lives into two sharply distinct categories. The daily life we did at work with worldly friends and our worldly business, and orthodoxy, which we live on Sundays and other times in the week when we have time for it. But the worldview of such a person who divides his life up this way, if we look closely at it, is often a strange combination of Christian values and worldly values, which really do not mix together very well at all. The purpose of this talk, therefore, is to see how people living today can begin to make their worldview more of one piece, to make it a whole Orthodox worldview. Orthodoxy is life. If we don't live Orthodoxy, we simply are not Orthodox, no matter what formal beliefs we might hold. This is the basic principle I would like to expound upon in this paper. Life today in our contemporary world has become very artificial, very uncertain, very confusing. It is true orthodoxy has a life of its own, but it is also not very far from the life of the world around us. And so the life of the orthodox Christian, even when he's being just purely orthodox, cannot help but reflect the life around us in some way. And so a kind of uncertainty and confusion have also entered into orthodox life in our times. In this talk, I will try to look at contemporary life and then at our Orthodox life to see how better we might fulfill our Christian obligation to lead otherworldly lives even in these quite terrible times. And to have an Orthodox Christian view of the whole of life today that will enable us to survive these times with our faith intact. Probably there will be all kinds of questions and discussion about this, which we will go into at the end. But the purpose, of course, for which we are doing this is survival, so that we might be able to survive as Orthodox Christians. 
Anyone who looks at our contemporary life from the perspective of the normal life lived by people in earlier times, say Russia or America or any country of Western Europe in the 19th century, cannot help but be struck by the fact how abnormal life has become today. The whole concept of authority and obedience, of decency and politeness, of public and private behavior, all have changed drastically have been turned, in fact, upside down, except in a few isolated pockets of people, usually Christians of some kind, who try to preserve the so-called old-fashioned way of life. Our abnormal life today can be characterized as spoiled or pampered. From infancy, today's child, as a general rule, is treated like a little god or goddess in the family. His whims are catered to, his desires fulfilled, he is surrounded by toys, amusements, comforts, he is not trained, or seldom trained, very rarely well trained, or brought up according to strict principles of Christian behavior, but left to develop whichever way his desires incline. Usually it's enough for the child to say, I want it, or I won't do it, for his obliging parents to bow down before him and let him have his way. Perhaps this does not happen all the time in every family, but it happens often enough to be the rule of contemporary childbearing and even the best-intentioned parents do not entirely escape from its influence. Even if they try to raise a child strictly, the neighbors are doing something else, and they have to take that into consideration in disciplining the child. When such a child becomes an adult, he naturally surrounds himself with the same things he is used to in his childhood, with comfort, amusements, and grown-up toys. Life becomes a constant search for fun, which, by the way, is a word which is totally unheard of in any other vocabulary. In 19th century Russia, they wouldn't have understood what this word means for any civilized, serious civilization. Life is a constant search for fun, which is so empty of any serious meaning that a visitor from any 19th century country, looking at our popular television programs, amusement parks, advertisements, movies, music, and almost any aspect of our popular culture, would think he has stumbled across a land of imbeciles. <laughs> <laughs> who have lost all contact with normal reality. We don't often take that into consideration because we are living in this society and we take it for granted. But really, some outsider comes in and often a person just from a country of Eastern Europe comes in where they have a very tough life and he sees how strange this way of life is that we think is normal. Some recent observers of our contemporary life have called the young people of today the me generation. In our times, the age of narcissism, self-worship characterized by a worship of and fascination with oneself that prevents a normal human life from developing. Others have spoken of the plastic universe or fantasy world in which so many people live today, unable to face or come to terms with the reality of the world around them or the problems within themselves. When the me generation turns to religion, which has been happening very frequently in the past several decades, it is usually to a plastic or fantasy form of religion. The religion of self-development, where the self remains the object of worship, of brainwashing and mind control, of deified gurus and swamis, of a pursuit of UFOs and extraterrestrial beings, of abnormal states and feelings. There's no need to go into all these right here. These manifestations are probably familiar to all of you in some form or other. Later on, I'll discuss a little how these touch on the Orthodox Christian spiritual life of our days. It is important for us to realize as we try ourselves to lead a Christian life today, that the world which has been formed by our pampered times makes demands on the soul, whether in religion or in secular life, which are what one has to call totalitarian. This is easy enough to see in the mind-bending cults that have received so much publicity in recent years, which demand total allegiance to a self-made holy man. But it is just as evident in secular life, where one is confronted not just by an individual temptation here or there, but by a constant state of temptation that attacks one whether in the background music heard everywhere in markets and businesses, in the public signs and billboards on city streets, in the rock music which is brought everywhere by its devotees, even to forest campgrounds and trails, and in the home itself where television often becomes the secret ruler of the household, dictating modern values, opinions, and tastes. And if you have young children, you know how true this is. When you've seen something on television, how difficult it is to fight against this new opinion which has been given as an authority by the television. 
The message of this universal temptation, which occurs in all these various forms, which attacks men today, and quite openly in the secular forms, but usually more hidden when it becomes religious, is something like the following motto. Live for the present, enjoy yourself, relax, be comfortable. In fact, these very phrases become part of our everyday talk. It's quite distinct from earlier times. Behind this message is another more sinister undertone, which is openly expressed only in the, really, in the officially atheist countries, which are one step ahead of the free world in this respect. In fact, we should realize that what is happening in the world today is very similar, whether it occurs behind the Iron Curtain or in the free world. There are different varieties of it, but a very similar attack is being made to get our soul. In the communist countries, which have a do official doctrine of atheism, they tell quite openly that you are to forget about God, forget about any other life but the present one, remove from your life the fear of God and reverence for holy things, regard those who still believe in God in the old-fashioned way as enemies who must be exterminated. One might take as a symbol of our carefree, fun-loving, self-worshipping times our American Disneyland. But if so, we should not neglect to see behind it the more sinister symbol that shows where the me generation is really headed. This symbol is what is well known in the Eastern countries under communism, the Soviet Gulag, a chain of concentration camps that still governs the life of nearly half the world population. What does all this have to do with us who are trying to lead as best we can a sober Orthodox Christian life? It has a lot to do with it. We have to realize that the life around us, abnormal though it is, is the place where we begin our own Christian life. Whatever we make of our life, whatever truly Christian content we give to it, it still has something of the stamp of the me generation on it. And we have to be humble enough to see this. That this is where we begin. There are two false approaches to the life around us that many often make today, thinking that somehow this is what Orthodox Christians should be doing. One approach, the most common one, is simply to go along with the times. Adapt yourself to rock, music, modern fashions and tastes, and the whole rhythm of our jazzed-up modern life. Often, the more old-fashioned parents will have little contact with this life and live their own life more or less separate from it. But they will smile when they see their children follow after the latest craze and think that this is something harmless. This path is total disaster if we want to live a Christian life. It is something that produces the death of the soul. There are some who can still lead an awkwardly respectable life without struggling against the spirit of the times, which is manifest in all these popular movements. But inwardly, such people are dead or dying. And the saddest thing of all, their children will pay the price in various psychic and spiritual disorders and sicknesses which become more and more commonplace. There are a few examples I might give. One of the leading members of the suicide cult that ended so spectacularly four years ago in Jonestown was the young daughter of a Greek Orthodox priest. Satanic rock groups like KISS, Kids in Satan's Service, are made up of ex-Russian Orthodox young people. The largest part of the membership of the Temple of Satan in San Francisco, according to a recent sociological survey, is made up of Orthodox boys. These are only a few striking cases. Most Orthodox young people don't go so far astray. They just blend in with the anti-Christian world around them and cease to be examples of any kind of Christianity for those who look at them. This, of course, is wrong if we take Christianity seriously. The Christian must be different from the world, above all from today's weird, abnormal world. And this must be one of the basic things he knows as part of his Christian upbringing. Otherwise, there is no point in calling ourselves Christians at all, much less Orthodox Christians. The false approach at the other extreme is what one might call fake spirituality. As translations of Orthodox books on the spiritual life become more widely available, and the Orthodox vocabulary of spiritual struggle is placed more and more in the air, one finds an increasing number of people talking about hesychasm, the Jesus prayer, the ascetic life, exalted states of prayer, and all manner of things like that. And the most exalted holy fathers, like St. Simeon the New Theologian, St. Gregory Palamas, St. Gregory the Sinite, and many others. It is all, of course, very well to be aware of this truly exalted side of Orthodox spiritual life, and to have reverence for the great saints who have actually lived it. But unless we have a very realistic and very humble awareness of how far away all of us today are from the life of hesychasm, and how little prepared we are even to approach it. Our interest in it will be only one more expression of our self-centered plastic universe. 
The me generation goes hesicast. That is what some people are trying to do today. In actuality, they're only adding a new game called Hesychasm to the attractions of Disneyland. There are books on the subject now, very popular. In fact, Roman Catholics are growing very big for this kind of thing. Under Orthodox influence, and themselves ortho influencing other Orthodox people. For example, there is uh, a Jesuit, because a Jesuit priest, Maloney, who writes all kinds of books and, trans and translations, and Macarius the Great, and some of theologians, tries to get people in, every in everyday life to be hesychasts and have all kinds of retreats, usually charismatic. People are inspired by the Holy Spirit, supposedly, and undertake all kinds of these disciplines which we get from Holy Fathers, which are far beyond the level in which we are today. It's a very unserious thing. There's also a lady, in fact, she's born in Russia, again a Catholic, who writes books called Pustinia, about the desert life today. Malchania. 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 Malchania, the silent life. And all these things which she tries to sort of put into life like, like you'd have some fashion for some kind of new candy. And this, of course, is very unserious and it's a very tragic sign of our times that these kind of exalted things are being used by people who have no idea what they're all about. Some people, for some people, it's only a habit or a pastime. For other people who take it seriously, it can be a great tragedy. And they think they're leading some kind of exalted life and really they haven't even come to terms with their own problems inside them. Let me then re-emphasize that both these extremes are to be avoided, both worldliness and super-spirituality. But this does not mean that we should not have a realistic awareness of the legitimate demands which the world makes upon us, or that we should cease respecting and taking sound instruction from the great Hesychast Fathers and using the Jesus prayer ourselves according to our circumstances and capacity. It just has to be on our level, down to earth. The point is, and this point is absolutely necessary, for our survival as Orthodox Christians in these perilous times, we must realize our situation as Orthodox Christians today. We must realize deeply what times we are living in, how little we actually know and feel our Orthodoxy, how far we are, not just from the saints of ancient times, we can't even touch them, but even from the ordinary Orthodox Christians of a hundred years ago, or even a generation ago, and how much we must humble ourselves just to survive as Orthodox Christians today. More specifically, what can we do to gain this awareness, this realization, and how can we make it fruitful in our lives? I will try to answer this question in two parts. First, concerning our awareness of the world around us, which as never before in the history of Christianity has become our conscious enemy. And second, concerning our awareness of orthodoxy, which I'm afraid most of us know much less than we should, and much less than we have to know if we wish to keep it. First, since whether we wish it or not, we are in the world, and its effects are felt strongly wherever you are today, even in a remote place like our monastery here. Therefore, we must face it and its temptation squarely and realistically, but without giving in to it. In particular, we must prepare our young people for the temptations facing them, and, as it were, inoculate them against the temptation. We must be aware that the world around us seldom helps and almost always hinders the upbringing of a child in the true Orthodox spirit. We must be ready to answer, to every day to answer the influence of the world by the principles of a sound Christian upbringing. This means, to go into a few more specific points, that what a child learns at school must be constantly checked and corrected at home. You can't assume what he's going to learn in school is something simply that's profitable or secular and has nothing to do with his orthodox outlook on life. Some a generation ago, you could have assumed that more or less. Now, no longer can, can do that. A child may be taught useful skills and facts in schools, although many schools in America today are failing miserably even with this. And in fact, many school teachers tell us that all they can do is keep the children in good order in class without even teaching them anything. But even if he gets this much, which few are getting, he is also taught many wrong attitudes in philosophy. The child's basic attitude towards an appreciation of literature, music, history, art, philosophy, even science, and of course, life and religion, must come, first of all, not from school, because the school will give you this all mixed up with modern philosophies. It must come first from the home and the church, or else a child is bound to be miseducated in today's world. The public education is at best agnostic and at worst openly atheistic or anti-religious. Of course, in the Soviet Union, all this is forced upon the child. There's no religion whatsoever, and there's an active program of making the child atheist. In America, it's not so bad. Perhaps in some places it's getting that bad, but not as bad. 
Another point, parents must know exactly what is being taught their children in sex education courses, which are almost universal today in American schools. And this must be corrected at home, not only by a frank attitude to this subject, especially between fathers and sons, a very rare thing in American society, but by, also by a clear setting forth of the moral aspect, uh, which is totally absent in public education. Another point, parents must know just what kind of music their children are listening to, what is in the movies they see, listening and seeing together with them when necessary, what kind of language they're exposed to, what kind of language they use, and various other points of common everyday life, and there must be a Christian answer, a Christian attitude given to all of us. Television and households where there is not enough courage to throw it out the window must be strictly controlled and supervised to avoid the poisonous effects of this machine which has become the leading educator of anti-Christian attitudes and ideas in the home itself, especially to the young. I speak about the raising of children because this is where the world first strikes its blows at Orthodox Christians and forms them in its image. Once wrong attitudes have been formed in a child, the task of giving him a Christian education becomes doubly difficult. But it is not only children, it is all of us who are facing the world which is trying to form us in anti-Christianity by means of schools, television, movies, popular music, and all the other influences that pound in upon us, most of all in the big cities. And we have to be aware that what is being pounded in upon us is it's all of one piece. It has a certain rhythm, a certain message to give us, this message of self-worship, of relaxing, of letting go, of enjoying yourself, of giving up any thought of <coughs> like In various forms, whether in music or in movies, television, what's being taught in schools, the way subjects are emphasized, the way the background is given, everything else. is one particular thing that is being given to us. It's actually an education in unbelief. In the Soviet Union, it's an education in atheism. We have to fight back by knowing just what the world is trying to do to us and by formulating and communicating our Orthodox Christian response to it. Frankly, from observing the way Orthodox families in today's world live and pass on their Orthodoxy, it would seem that this battle is more often lost than won. The percentage of Orthodox Christians who retain their Orthodox identity intact and are not changed into the image of today's world is rather small. I don't mean just people who continue to go to church on Sundays, because many people going to church on Sundays are not very aware of what their religion is all about. However, having said this much, I must say now that it is not necessary to view the world around us as all bad. If it was, there would be almost no hope for us. In fact, for our survival as Orthodox Christians, we have to be smart enough to use whatever is positive in the world for our benefit. And here I'll go into a few points where we can use something in the world which seems to be nothing to do directly with orthodoxy in order to formulate our orthodox worldview. For example, the child who has been exposed from his earliest years to good classical music and has seen his soul being developed by it will not be nearly as tempted by the crude rhythms and message of rock and other contemporary forms of pseudo music as someone who has grown up without a musical education. Such a musical education, as several of the often elders have said, refines the soul and prepares it for the reception of spiritual impressions. The child, second point, the child who has been educated in good literature, drama, and poetry, and has felt their effect in his own soul, that is, has really enjoyed them, will not easily become an addict of the contemporary movies and television programs and cheap novels which devastate the soul and take it away from the Christian path. Another point, the child who has learned to see beauty in classical painting and sculpture will not easily be drawn into the, the perversity of contemporary art or be attracted by the garish products of modern advertising and pornography. Another very important point, the child who knows something of the history of the world, especially in Christian times, and how other people have lived and thought, what mistakes and pitfalls people have fallen into by departing from God and his commandments and what glorious and influential lives they have lived when they were faithful to him, will be discerning about the life and philosophy of our own times and will not be inclined to follow the first new philosophy or way of life he encounters. One of the basic problems facing people educating children today is that in the schools they are no longer given a sense of history, that anybody has lived before us. Anybody who knows anything about history before the Second World War is considered ancient history. It's actually it's a very dangerous, fatal kind of a thing to give a child because it means he has no ability to take examples from the way people lived in the past. And actually, history constantly repeats itself. Once you see that, it becomes interesting. It becomes interesting how people are falling into the same traps today. And you begin to see how we can answer this, how people have answered it in the past, how there have been people who 
went against God and what results came from that, now people changed their lives and became exceptions and gave an example which has lived on to our own time. Therefore, this sense of history is a very important thing that should be communicated. In general, the person who is well acquainted with the best products of secular culture, which in the West almost always have definite religious and Christian overtones, has a much better chance of leading a normal, fruitful, orthodox life than someone who knows only the popular culture of today. One who is converted to orthodoxy straight from rock culture, anyone who thinks he can com combine orthodoxy with that kind of culture, has much suffering to go through and a difficult road in life before he can become a truly serious orthodox Christian who is capable of handing on his faith to others. Without this suffering, without this awareness, orthodox parents will raise children who will be devoured by the contemporary world around us. The world's best culture, properly received, refines and develops the soul. Today's popular culture cripples and deforms the soul and hinders it from having a full and normal response to the message of orthodoxy. Therefore, in our battle against the spirit of this world, we can use the best things the world has to offer in order to go beyond them. Everything good in the world, if we are only wise enough to see it, points to God and to orthodoxy. And we have to make use of it. <clears throat> With such an attitude, a view both of the world, the good things in the world, and the bad things in the world, it is possible for us to have and to live an orthodox worldview. That is, an orthodox view on the whole of life, not just on narrow church subjects. There exists a false opinion, which unfortunately is all too widespread today, that it is enough to have an orthodoxy that is limited to the church building and formal orthodox activities, such as praying at certain times or making the sign of the cross. In everything else, so this opinion goes, one can be like anyone else, participating in the life and culture of our times without any problem, as long as we don't commit sin. Anyone who has come to realize how deep orthodoxy is and how full is the commitment which is required of the serious orthodox Christian, and likewise what totalitarian demands the contemporary world is making on us, will easily see how wrong this opinion is. One is orthodox all the time, every day, in every situation of life, or one is not really orthodox at all. Our orthodoxy is revealed not just in our strictly religious views, but in everything we do and say. Most of us are very unaware of the Christian religious responsibility we have for the seemingly secular part of our lives. A person with a truly orthodox worldview lives every part of his life as orthodox and Christian. Let us therefore ask here, how can we nourish and support this orthodox worldview in our daily life? That is, what are the orthodox things which strengthen us as opposed or rather added to those worldly things which we already mentioned as helping out the orthodox worldview? The first and most obvious way is to be in constant contact with the sources of Christian nourishment, with everything that the Church gives for our enlightenment and salvation. Church services and holy mysteries, Holy Scripture, the lives of saints, the writings of the Holy Fathers. One must, of course, read books that are on one's own level of understanding and apply the Church's teachings to one's own circumstances in life. Then they can be fruitful in guiding us and changing us in the Christian way. But often these basic Christian sources do not have their full effect on us, or they don't really affect us at all, because we don't have the right Christian attitude towards them and towards the Christian life they're supposed to inspire. Let me say a word here about what our attitude should be if we are to obtain real benefit from them, and if they are going to be for us the beginning of a truly orthodox worldview. First of all, Christian spiritual food, by its very nature, is something which is living and nourishing. If our attitude towards it is only academic and bookish, we will fail to get the benefit it is meant to give. Therefore, if we read orthodox books, or are interested in orthodoxy only to gain information, or to show off our knowledge to others, we are missing the point. If we learn of the commandments of God and the laws of His Church, merely so we can be correct and judge the incorrectness of others, we are missing the point. These things must not merely affect our ideas, they must directly touch our lives and change them. In any time of great crisis in human affairs, such as the critical times right in front of us in the free world, it's a matter not, not of centuries or decades, it's a matter of Year, a few years or months in front of us, it's critical times. In these times, those who place their trust in outward knowledge, in laws and canons and correctness, will be unable to stand. The strong ones then will be those whose orthodox education has given them a feel for what is truly Christian, those whose orthodoxy is in the heart and is capable of touching other hearts. 
nothing is more tragic than to see someone who is raised in orthodoxy, has a certain idea of the catechism, has read some lives of saints, has a general outline of what orthodoxy stands for, understands some of the services, and then is totally unaware of what is going on around him. And he has children and gives to his children this life in two categories. One is the way most people live, and the other way is the way Orthodox live on Sundays and when they're reading some Orthodox text. And the child who's raised like that is most likely not going to take the Orthodox. It's going to be a very small part of his life because the contemporary life is too attractive. And too many people are going for it. It's too much a part of reality today, unless he's been really taught how to approach it, how to guard himself against the bad effects of it and how to take the good things which are in the world. Therefore, a second point, our attitude beginning right now must be down to earth and normal. We say this in a time when everything has become very abnormal and weird. That is, our attitude must be applied to the real circumstances of our life. It cannot be a product of fantasy and escapism and refusal to face the often unpleasant facts of the world around us. If our orthodoxy is too exalted, too much in the clouds, it belongs in a hothouse and is incapable of helping us in our daily life, let alone saying anything for the salvation of those around us. Our world is quite cruel, and it wounds souls with its harshness. And we have to respond, first of all, with down-to-earth Christian love and understanding, leaving accounts of hesychasm and advanced forms of prayer to those capable of receiving them. So also our attitude must be not self-centered, but reaching out to those who are seeking for God and for a godly life. Nowadays, whenever there is a good-sized Orthodox community, the temptation is to make it into a society for self-congratulation and for taking delight in our Orthodox virtues and achievements. The beauty of our church buildings and furnishings, the splendor of our services, even the purity of our doctrine. But the true Christian life, ever since the time of the Apostles, has always been inseparable from communicating it to others. An orthodoxy that is alive by this very fact shines forth to others, and there is no need to open a department of missions to do this. The fire of true Christianity communicates itself without this. If our orthodoxy is only something we keep for ourselves and boast about it, then we are the dead burying the dead, which is precisely the state of many of our orthodox parishes today, even those that have a large number of young people, if they are not going deeply into their faith. It's not enough to say the young people are going to church, but to ask what are they getting in church? What are they taking away from church? And if they are not making orthodoxy a part of their whole life, then it's not that they're going to be in church. Likewise, another point, our orthodoxy must be loving and forgiving. There's a kind of hardness which has crept into orthodox life today. You say things like, that man is a heretic, don't go near him. Or that one is orthodox, supposedly, but you can't really be sure. Or that one there is obviously a spy. <laughs> See, it's apparently a common thing. <laughs> Often we don't mean this too seriously, but this attitude is a very cruel one, and it can become very hard, harsh. No one will deny that the church is surrounded by enemies today, or that there are some who stoop to taking advantage of our trust and confidence. But this is the way it has been since the time of the apostles, and the Christian life has always been something of a risk in this practical way. But even if we are sometimes taken advantage of, in fact, new Christians in places like Ghana and Africa, where they really take their Christianity seriously, and they, they read the gospel, they begin to act according to the gospel. They give themselves up. When someone hits them on the cheek, they turn the other cheek. They give away things without expecting anything in return. And the pagans who live in places like Ghana and Nigeria, they delight in this because they say, aha, there's a Christian we can take advantage of. Go take something, you won't expect it back. <laughs> and the Christians, of course, they do it in good faith. And they get the reward for that, even though they're taken advantage of. Of course, we have to be, we have to show some caution. So we aren't simply done in completely. But still, we cannot give up our basic attitude of love and trust. Because without that, we lose one of the very foundations of our Christian life. The world which has no Christ is more true than ever before, but today that the world has no Christ, even when it sometimes talks about it on television, has to be mistrustful and cold. But Christians, on the contrary, have to be loving and open, or else we will lose the salt of Christ within us and become just like the world, good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. A little humility in looking at ourselves would help us to be more generous and forgiving of the faults of others. We love often to judge others for the strangeness of their behavior. Often we call them cuckoos, or a particular phrase used nowadays, crazy converts. 
It is of course true that we should beware of really unbalanced people who can do great harm in the church. But one should ask the question, what serious Orthodox Christian today is not a little crazy? We don't fit in with the ways of the world. If we do, in today's world, which has become so weird, we are serious Christians. A true Christian today cannot be at home in the world. He cannot help but feel himself and be regarded by others as a little crazy. Finally, our Christian attitude must be what, for want of a better word, I would call something which is very unfashionable today, innocent. Today, the world places a high value on sophistication, on being worldly wise, on being a professional. Orthodoxy places no value on these qualities. They kill the Christian soul. And yet, these qualities constantly creep into the church and into our lives. How often one hears enthusiastic converts, especially, express their desire of going to the great Orthodox centers, the cathedrals and monasteries where sometimes thousands of the faithful come together. Everywhere the talk is of church matters, and one can feel how important Orthodoxy is after all. That is, Orthodoxy is a small drop in the bucket when you look at the whole of society, but in these great cathedrals and monasteries, there's so many people that it seems as though it's a really important thing. It makes us feel important. And how often one sees these same people in a pitiful state after they have indulged their desires, returning from these great Orthodox centers, sour and dissatisfied, filled with worldly church gossip and criticism, anxious above all to be correct and proper and worldly wise about church politics. In a word, they have lost their innocence, their unworldliness, being led astray by their fascination with the worldly side of the church's life. In various forms, this is a temptation to everyone today in the church. And we must fight it by not allowing ourselves to overvalue the externals of the church, but always returning to the one thing needful, Christ and the salvation of our souls from this wicked generation. We do not need to be ignorant of what goes on in the world and in the church. In fact, for our own self-defense, we have to know something of this. But our knowledge must be practical and simple and single-minded, not sophisticated and not worldly. It is obvious for any Orthodox Christian with some awareness of what Orthodoxy is, some awareness of what the world looks like today, who looks at the world from the point of view of Orthodoxy, the Orthodox worldview, it's obvious that our world is coming to its end. The signs of the times are so obvious that one might say that the world is coming crashing to its end. What are some of these signs? First of all, the abnormality of the world. Never have such weird and unnatural manifestations and behavior been accepted as a matter of course as in our days. Just look at the world around you, what's in the newspapers, what kind of movies are being shown, what's on the television, what it is that people think interesting and amusing that they laugh at. It's absolutely weird. And there are people who deliberately promote this, of course, for their own benefit, for their own money, and also because that's the fashion, because there's a kind of perverse craving for this kind of thing. Another thing, the wars, rumors of wars, each more cold and merciless than the one preceding it, and all overshadowed by the threat of the unthinkable universal nuclear war, which could be set off with a touch of a button, which has become very much in the news in the air in the last year or two. People have become aware that indeed this is a very real possibility. Again, the widespread natural disasters, earthquakes, and now volcanoes, the newest one forming not far from here, near Yosemite Park in Central California, which are already changing the world's weather patterns. Again, the increasing centralization of information on and power over the individual, represented in particular by the enormous new computer in Luxembourg, which has the capacity to keep a file of information on every man living. Another point, the multiplication of false Christs and false antichrists. The latest candidate just this summer spent probably millions of dollars advertising his impending appearance on world television, promising to give, at that time, a telepathic message to all the world's inhabitants. Quite apart from any occult powers which might be involved in such events, we already know well enough the opportunities for presenting subliminal messages by radio and especially by television, as well as the fact that this can be done by anyone with the technology for breaking into ma to normal radio and television signals, no matter how many laws there might be against it. Another point, the truly weird response to the new movie everyone in America is talking about and seeing, E.T., the extraterrestrial, has caused literally millions of seemingly normal people to express their affection and love for the hero who is a savior from outer space who is quite obviously a demon. And all this is an obvious preparation for the worship of the coming Antichrist. And incidentally, the movie editor, there's a, there's a review in the New Orthodox America of this film, which I think we should all read. There was also a review of this film in the recent uh, newspaper, The Greek Archdiocese. And the, a 
priest who reviewed it said it's a wonderful movie that can teach us about love and everything to see it. It means that there's quite a contrast between people who are trying to be aware of what's going on and those who are simply led into the mood of the times. I could go on with details like this, but my purpose is not to frighten you, but to make you aware of what is happening around us. It is truly later than we think. The apocalypse is now. And how tragic it is to see Christians, and above all, Orthodox young people, with this incalculable tragedy hanging over their heads, who think they can continue what is called a normal life in these terrible times, participating fully in the whims of this silly, self-worshipping generation, totally unaware that the fool's paradise we are living in is about to crash and completely unprepared for the desperate times that lie just ahead of us. There is no longer even a question of being a good or a poor Orthodox Christian. The question now is, will our faith survive at all? With many, it will not survive. The coming Antichrist will be too attractive, too much in the spirit of the worldly things we now crave, for most men even to know that they have lost their Christianity by bowing down to him. Still, the call of Christ comes to us. Let us, after becoming aware of some of these things, begin at last to pay attention to it. The clearest expression of this call today is coming from the enslaved atheist world, where there is real suffering for Christ and the seriousness of life which, is, which we are rapidly losing and have already lost. One Orthodox priest in Romania, Father George Calcio, who is now near death in the communist prison, for daring to challenge young seminarians and students to put off their blind allegiance to the spirit of the times and come forward to labor for Christ, he gave a series of talks in 1978, for which he received a sentence of 10 years in the concentration camp, and after which he was subjected to we're beatings. Publishing. And we're publishing. We're publishing. The last issue of Orthodox Word contained the first installment in two parts. There's seven talks addressed to young people, because he speaks to people who have been raised as atheists, so the situation is a little more drastic than what we have here. But the basic battle is the same. After speaking of the emptiness of atheism, he tells today's young people, quote, I call you to a much higher flight, to total abandonment, to an act of courage which defies reason. I call you to God, to the one that transcends the world, so that you might know an infinite heaven of spiritual joy, the heaven which you presently grope for in your personal hell, and which you seek even while in a state of non-deliberate revolt. Jesus has always loved you, but now you have the choice to respond to his invitation. In responding, you are ordained to go and bear fruit that will remain, to be a prophet of Christ in the world in which you live, to love your neighbor as yourself, and to make all men your friends, to proclaim by every action this unique and limitless love which has raised man from the level of a slave to that of a friend of God, to be the prophet of this liberating love which delivers you from all constraint, returning to you your integrity as you offer yourself to God. End of quote. Father George, speaking to young people who had little inspiration to serve Christ's church because they had accepted the worldly opinion, which is common also in the free world, that the church is only a set of buildings or a worldly organization, the fact that the priestly calling is simply another job, which is paid for by the government, who calls them and us to a deeper awareness of Christ's church and of how our formal membership in it is not enough to save us. He says, quote, The church of Christ is alive and free, in her we move and have our being, through Christ who is her head. In him we have full freedom. In the church we learn of truth, and the truth will set us free. You are in Christ's church whenever you uplift someone bent down in sorrow, or when you give alms to the poor and visit the sick. You are in Christ's <clears throat> church when you cry out, Lord, help me. You are in Christ's church when you are good and patient, when you refuse to get angry at your brother, even if he has wounded your feelings. You are in Christ's church when you pray, Lord, forgive him. When you work honestly at your job, returning home weary in the evenings, but with a smile upon your lips. When you repay evil with love, you are in Christ's church. Do you not see, therefore, young friend, how close the church of Christ is? You are Peter, and God is building his church upon you. You are the rock of his church, against which nothing can prevail. Let us build churches with our faith, churches which no human power can pull down, a church whose foundation is Christ. Feel for your brother alongside you. Never ask, who is he? Rather say, he is no stranger. He is my brother. He is the Church of Christ, just as I am. End of quote. With such a call in our hearts, let us begin really to belong to the Church of Christ, the Orthodox Church. Outward membership is not enough. 
Something must move within us that makes us different from the world around us, even as that world calls itself Christian and even Orthodox. Let us keep and nourish those qualities of the true Orthodox worldview, which I mentioned earlier. A living, normal attitude, loving and forgiving, not self-centered, preserving our innocence and unworldliness, even with a full and humble awareness of our own sinfulness and the power of the worldly temptations which surround us. If we truly live this Orthodox worldview, our faith will survive the shocks ahead of us and be a source of inspiration and salvation for those who will still be seeking Christ even amidst the shipwreck of humanity which has already begun today. As long as some questions about any aspect of this talk. I have one question. Could you uh, tell us of some movies that may uh, portray a uh, Christian virtue? Well, yes, there are lots of them, but they don't make them anymore. <laughs> Maybe they do once in a while, it's very rare. Old ones. Well, any old movie like uh, Shakespearean plays, Hamlet, uh, any of the, there's a lot of good English movies made in the 50s, and the stories of Dickens, like the Pickwick Papers and something. Usually, sometimes you can see them on television even, but it's interrupted by commercials so much that you lose the point. So, sometimes in big cities, there'll be a, a theater that specializes in those kinds of films. So if you look, you see all kinds of, especially these movies from the 50s, maybe even 60s, that, that are dramatizations of novels plays, classic plays, and often they're very well done, and there's a point. Everything of Dickens is that way, it's full of, of, of Christianity, he doesn't mention Christ even, but it's full of love. Like this, this hero, there's a, you saw this last this Christmas, uh, Pickle Papers, and it's quite well done, and betrayed sort of evil in its ugly form. And then one character, Pickwick, who is simply a person who refuses to give up his innocence and trust him. And finally, he gets put in the debtor's prison because he trusts him. And there comes to him the man who put him in prison finally, and seduced his uh, some kind of relative or something and everything else. And Pickwick gives him money and weeps over him. So he can buy a meal because he has no, no money to buy food in the debtor's prison. And you see the, this criminal, this person who's taking advantage of everybody, a real no-gooder, and one little tear for him. It's, it's odd. And at the end, Mr. Pickwick is triumphant because he trusted men, but it's basically he's a Christian. He trusts them, and in the end he wins because people's hearts are changed. And there are lots of movies like that that show these old movies, quite a few of them, that show either the, the passions of men, the innocence, various Christian virtues. In fact, these 19th century novels on which they're based are all very down-to-earth and real, and they show how to sort of live a normal life, how to deal with these various passions which arise. So they don't give it on a spiritual level, but they give by showing it in life and having a basic Christian understanding of life, it's very <coughs> beneficial. But the movies nowadays, I don't know of any that are that, that way. Maybe here and there there's one. They're all becoming so weird. Yes? I was wondering about the chairs of fire. I haven't seen the movie, but is it Chariots of Fire, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. This is the runners. The runners. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good one, yeah. So I think, I think, in fact, that we should seek out more of these old movies. And arrange for sure. They don't cost much. They're very cheap. You can buy them. You rent them for $50, sometimes less. If you get a group together, say a church group, get together and show some of these movies. It's very good. The young people are interested in them. Show, it sort of it shows how people behaved on the screen and in real life before all these weird movies and television programs came into fashion. That's exactly what we had in mind. We're going to have a retreat where we're going to stress the theme of other world leaders. And we'd like part of that retreat to be of a movie portraying uh, Christian I'm wondering about your mentioning of the EP, that a positive approach would be a kind of a constructive spiritual criticism rather than total rejection. You know, it's a discern what's bad and what's good, because some of the scenes are hard to find. And that's the thing that's called. Yes, I would say yes in that respect. There's something to be said for that. But Dickens is heartwarming with regard to normal everyday life. And this is heartwarming with regard to some kind of freak. <laughs> and he becomes more like a savior, this freak, freakish thing. And therefore, the good, the doubt is a good effect and well done. But the fact that it's so freakish and weird and abnormal already takes away the benefit of the positive experience. 
compared to our times, of course, compared to many movies, it's, in that respect, it's positive. But the very fact that it has in its very center this freakish thing, I think, is, is a very big thing against it. What is like the definition of the Antichrist? I know it's not really the devil or a demon or something, but it, it's like the spirit of the Antichrist. What is it? Well, Antichrist is several things. One, it is the man who will come at the very end of the world. He will be a man. There are various characteristics of him. The fathers have written various treatises on the subject, describing what he will be like. He will be a man, a Jew, the tribe of Dan, will rule in Jerusalem, will be in the temple of Jerusalem, which will be reconstructed for him, and be the world leader, before whom everybody bows down because they recognize that he is religious and pious and kind and loving and all those. That's why it's very, this ET thing is dangerous because Antichrist will be precisely that. He will evoke emotions of love and kindness and everything else. But it will be on the basis of some kind of weird thing that is not worshiping the true God, but eventually worshiping him. So he's a man who will come at the end of the world, and when he is finally destroyed, the whole world comes to its end. But no. besides that, St. John says there are many Antichrists. It's everyone who participates in this spirit of, well, first of all, as St. John in the, one of his epistles defines it, denying that Christ has come in the flesh. This is the spirit of Antichrist. And so everyone who does that partakes in this spirit. And we can see in the world today there is a spirit of Antichrist, going against Christ, against the Church. And that All that spirit is the spirit of Antichrist. It finally achieves its form, its incarnation, like it, as it were, in the one man who will come at the end and imitate Christ. And that he'll be 30 years old when he comes to power and do many of the very same things that Christ did. And he will be some kind of demonic marvel by occult power. So he's an anti means actually in place of Christ. It means both against Christ and in place of Christ, substitute Christ, for those who do not know what who Christ is. Yes. How does it work with Antichrist? I mean, if because his deeds are good in seeming. They seem to be good. And he's, he's doing kind deeds in order to trap men. But we see that in everyday life. That when you use some kind of thing which evokes love, and you use kindness in order to trick somebody into doing something for you, then it becomes, in itself, it might be good, and somebody outside might even become instructed by seeing that. But the man, in his intent, is doing evil. And therefore, that evil that's good becomes submerged in the evil he's doing. Yes? Again, um, what's, like, what's so wrong about having fun? I just... <laughs> not something that would be that would be harmful to other people or that that's that's to say against the church views or whatever just just like sharing company with other people and enjoying yes the well you said we have this modern word fun for it. that's not actually fun that's some kind of entertainment or uh, good time something like that nowadays we have this word fun which sort of you can use that word of course in, in the way it's usually used so it's also nothing wrong with it so sort of, you can see that it has overtones of sort of fun as an empty thing. And the thing is something that's totally empty, has no meaning to it, especially when it becomes involved with something which is weird or abnormal. Then it, it's deprived of its, any kind of positive value. But of course, ordinary talking to people, having good times, <clears throat> going on picnics and having sort of wholesome fun, wholesome enjoyment, nothing wrong with that. It's when it becomes something empty or something weird that it's... What do you think about maintaining the church? Well, I've never actually seen one in operation, but I, I'm very suspicious myself. <laughs> the parents who have seen them, of course, they can, they can see what they're all about. Occupying uh, all the children's time. Yeah, it is, there's something funny about it because... The biggest industry right now. Yeah. Oh, but you don't have to spend all your time in front of them. <laughs> I mean, I can't like, agree that like they're all bad. <laughs> well, nobody said they're all bad. Okay. Somebody said one was questioning them. They're entirely good either. If they encourage people to get sort of off into fantasy world of their own, of course, that's not good. But it's sort of symptomatic that it's a kind of enjoyment which is sort of abstract and you just sort of sit in one place and it's sort of not. It's, it's, what? It's a fantasy. Yeah, it, it involves very much this fantasy world which is. Uh, War. Well, there are all kinds of aspects you can, you can talk about. 
But it's a lot of these things you can't say are sort of entirely evil. You should absolutely forbid them. But you have to be aware of the, the characters. And where you do allow such things like that, it has to be within certain limits. A person who spends all his time in this fantasy world with all these, these strange games, it's obviously very wrong. It's much more wholesome to have things which actually help to exercise the body, or help you to have contact with other people, so the more normal enjoyments, which in the 19th century were all they had. And nowadays we have these various, various things which either encourage fantasy, which is not very healthy, or make one sort of idle, and not doing anything constructive, which actually helps one out. Now, any more questions? I think the sort of it's a very complex thing to look at this whole question because it's not so easy that you can point at almost any one thing and say, that's wrong, get rid of it. Sometimes for your own benefit or your family's benefit, you can do it. Like some family is strong enough to throw the television out. And they have an answer to that. When the children say so-and-so is watching it, they have the answer to that. They, don't, they aren't bothered by that. But uh, it isn't necessarily a, a question of totally abolishing certain things. It's a question of beginning to become aware so that when these movies, for example, the television programs are mentioned, you can begin to understand what kind of thing is going on. There's some things obviously you have to forbid your children from seeing. Or if it's some kind of a thing which is uncertain, perhaps you watch it with them and then begin to explain to them what it's all about, why there's a, there are dangerous aspects. In fact, the whole process of forming an orthodox worldview is not so that you can say, this is right, this is wrong, this kind of thing has to be thrown out, that thing has to be left. And some things you can say that, but in many things are very complicated, and there's some even positive aspects of some things which are not entirely good. And therefore, the orthodox worldview means you look at them from the point of view critically to take whatever is good, if there is anything good, or and to reject what is evil. If there's something which is simply too evil, you simply throw the whole thing out. But you have you have an idea why you're doing it. It's not just a blind following. It's some kind of rule. Yes. You mentioned uh, the new faith, uh, the, the faith that we have that we call it plastic. Yes. What can we do to uh, change that? If, if we're moving toward that. Well, I think the more we are aware of it, the more it helps. The more we are becoming aware of what is normal. Like I think becoming aware, for example, of these, these uh, 19th century novels and the movies based upon them, you see they're sort of normal. In fact, it's often refreshing to see uh, in the movie where they have an uh, old-fashioned dance and you compare with what dances are nowadays, and you see there was a totally different standard of life, for how they amused themselves, what they considered to be enjoyments. And you see today we're totally spoiled and pampered and there's a whole different idea. And therefore, we can try to put into our lives more of those normal things. I have more picnics, more sort of outdoor things, more things which involve the person doing something and not simply being a spectator. All that, of course, helps to form a more wholesome attitude. And the more we're aware of that, the more we begin to see that there are certain things which are better for us and certain things which are worse for us. And that helps us to sort of see through this plastic side of life. Because in, in practice, I think the more you become aware of that, the more you begin to see what to do in practical reality. Yes? Well, I think it's a great tragedy because it is based upon the assumption that nobody has the right faith. And therefore, we go, supposedly the Orthodox go to these ecumenical meetings to confess the right faith. But you see, they don't. If they do, it's just sort of a minority view. No one listens to them. It's not, in fact, the Orthodox who go. They themselves talk about the, what is it, the tragedy of the Orthodox involvement because nobody listens to them, nobody understands. It's obviously the Orthodox who is dragged in because they are a big body which is influential. And they are not giving the truth to people who need it. Therefore, we participate. A large church doesn't, but some of the jurisdictions do. They participate in prayers with the Roman Catholics or the Lutherans. And we know that those people are participating in prayers with the Methodists and the Unitarians, and they are participating in prayers with the Buddhists and the, maybe even Satanists somewhere along the line. And you see that there's an idea that everything is relative. There's no real firm idea of what is true. And it's a betrayal of the truth to participate in that without... Uh, we, we shouldn't participate, we should distinctly say what is wrong with being one in faith with them, because we aren't one in faith. The assumption is, in fact, it's said openly now, that there's no real difference between Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And we know that there's a crucial difference, and there's a matter of life and death. There are people who suffered for that difference, who were martyred by the Roman Catholics for the sake that they would not change their faith. And we have that true faith, which the world needs. Therefore, we should 
rather go out and convert them rather than take part in these assemblies which assume that there's no real difference. In that respect, I'd say it's a great tragedy. The Orthodox shouldn't be participating in that at all. And the fact that they do participate is very dissatisfying to people who have any you know, Orthodox conscience. And the ones that don't have much of an Orthodox conscience are simply going to sell out eventually. And they will be one with the Pope, who will be one with the Protestants, who will be one with the Unitarians and the Buddhists. And uh, that's all preparing for the reign of Antichrist, who will unite everyone in one. Doesn't mean that everybody's going to believe the same thing. Everybody will seem to believe what they want and be tolerant of to everybody else and all bow down to the Antichrist. So the definite the ecumenical movement, I think, is, a, is one of the signs of the times that we're preparing for this great world of ruler who's going to come not in order to protect the Orthodox faith, but to be telling everybody, enjoy yourself. Just bow down to me and enjoy yourself. That's the, the whole end of it. Most of you left? Yes. Not specifically. Yes, uh huh. And Yes. Question, how do you receive the grace of God? And where can we be in Christ? And how can we achieve that? And that's the whole question of Christian life. <laughs> of course, the reason he's asking it is because that's the basic question in Christian life. How do we obtain grace, which is that which makes us different from the world, different from the natural person? That is, the life in Christ has to have something supernatural. And the grace of God, the name we give for that thing which is supernatural. And we read the life of St. Pantaleon, but there are many things in that life which are supernatural. That came from grace. Often the martyrs, we, we think it's incredible the way they were tortured and actually put to death, came back to life again and again. That's the grace of God acting. And in us, it is not usually so dramatic as that. But uh, we have to have the grace of God in order to be different from our normal self, and different from the world around us. And the way to get it is... Well, he mentions deeds and works in Christ, but not by themselves. It has to be in connection with faith in the regular life of the Orthodox Church. Actually, we are given that in the, the sacraments and are becoming aware through reading the Scripture and the Holy Fathers, lives of saints, what is the real Orthodox life, how we fall short. And, of course, in the end, St. Seraphim says that not one single thing we do actually gives us this grace. Not by, you can't get it by simply standing all night in vigil or sitting on a pillar or doing any kind of extraordinary ascetic struggles. You can only get it by those things are means to the end. And if they work, that's fine. But the basic thing is you must have the right faith, the orthodox faith, lived in the church with the sacraments and yourself struggling, doing these works indeed. That is in accordance with the level on which each person is. Therefore, it's a matter of where you are. You begin right there to read, to take part in the life of the church, to offer struggles to God, to begin to love each other. That's what George says. Become aware of the people around you. Begin to see that you're responsible for them, for being at least kind and cheerful, trying to do good deeds, and to be aware of the, the unhappiness of others, to cheer them up and to help them out. All those things are promoting this life, which is involved with the giving of grace. And giving of grace is God's gift. That is, we cannot calculate it by any of those things that will come. But if we do those things, we have faith that God will give it. Complex subject, but if you simply live the life which the Church presents to us, we begin to obtain it. Yeah. I agree. I see that we need to be aware of the signs of the times. Why do you feel that um, it's, you know, the last times now are... I mean, it seems to me that things could get a lot worse and stay a lot worse for a lot longer. Well, the last times I don't say sort of exactly how many years or anything like that. The, si the signs are multiplying. What was the what was the he says, why do I think it's the last times? He thinks perhaps things should get a lot worse than they are. Of course, they will get worse. They'll keep getting worse. And in the history of the world, things have been getting worse. And sometimes there have even been times when it looked as though the end might be close. And for various reasons, perhaps men repented, changed themselves, and so the end was perhaps put off. And it could happen again like that. They change themselves, and this whole abnormality in life changes, and 
No, but I think the answer, the answer is that they have to explain about the, the phenomena of apostasy. That's what we mean by the last time. Well, yes, there, there are, there's the a whole... Term of apostasy. There are a whole set of characteristics which are to prevail at the end of the world, including the fact that the gospel is preached to all the world. And now, virtually every dialect, even in Africa, has at least one gospel in their, in their dialect. And all the major languages now have at least a New Testament. And that's one sign. Another sign is the possibility for there to be one world ruler, which only in our times is a very real possibility. Another sign is what's happening in Israel. In fact, the Jews possess the temple ground. The temple must be built for Antichrist. It's the first time in 2,000 years that has happened. That's an obvious sign that something might be close. And the fact that sort of people are being pushed together into one world civilization, and this apostasy, that is, that is that Christian values are being squeezed out of society, and not by pagans, but by people who used to be Christians. That's the apostasy means the falling away from something which you once had. All those characteristics are very strikingly true in our times. You can't necessarily point to sort of a set number of years, but it looks very close to the thing is going. Oh yes, and the fact, yes, the Jews who are also... In fact, there's two things about the Jews. One, that they are looking for the world ruler. Here's the notice. Yes, this is the notice published in the New York Times uh, a few months ago. Well, the very fact that this man recently published in the New York Times and all the big newspapers in the country, the fact that he's going to appear on television, he says, Christ is coming. He will appear on television sometime in the summer. And you simply have to prepare yourself and accept him because this is the end times. And this one is about, uh, it's actually a more secular kind of thing, but uh, Jews who assume, it says, at that time, the troubled times before the coming of the Messiah, your people shall be delivered, everyone who shall be found inscribed in the book. So it says here, you got to sign up to get your name put in a book, the Torah book. You pay, you pay a certain amount of money, and your name will be inscribed in this book, which will get you prepared for the coming of the Messiah. Of course, it's out to, they're out to make money, whatever their, their purpose is, unless they use this sort of thing in the air that the Messiah is close. They even put it in Hebrew letters, convince you. <laughs> Jews of the world tonight, they prepare for the Messiah. But there's a second thing that is, at the end of the world, the Jews are to be converted to Christ, at least the faithful remnant. And we see this already happens. That is, yeah, the prophet Elias is going to come. But I, I know pious Jews, not the ones, the ones in Israel, sort of, they're very secular. Although the Orthodox Judaism is their official religion, but they're very sort of worldly and secular. But there are many pious people who won't accept the Messiah until the prophet Elias comes. In fact, some specify he has to be on a white horse. But anyway, they were very sort of fundamental that way that Elias will come and tell them where the Messiah is. And we believe Elias is going to come and say the Messiah already came and you missed him. Now worship him. And of course, with that, they're going to accept him. But already many Jews are being converted. In fact, in Russia, the most People coming out, many people coming out are Jews, and a large number of them are, are converted to Christianity. In fact, people who are there say that the largest movement among people to be converted in Russia is among the Jews, because it's, it's one of the signs of the times also. But those, all those point to this as fact that the times do seem to be close. Well, yes? Have you heard the latest prophecy on the end of the world in 1994? No, I haven't heard that one. <laughs> but of course, it says there will be false Christs, and also there will be false antichrists, and false prophecies, and everything to get you mixed up. You wait for 1994, it doesn't happen, therefore you give up the ship and decide that nothing's going to happen. Maybe it's going to happen in 1996. You're a fool. Because no, we don't place our hope in a date, because no one knows the date. It's just we prepare ourselves, and in fact, the wise person is preparing himself every day for that, because we ourselves will die. So prepare for your own death. And the end of the world is simply have sort of on the worldwide scale that same thing we're preparing for and preparing for our death. So when we prepare for that, it isn't that we should be hysterical or sell all our property and begin to sit in a, on a mountain someplace waiting for the end. It means we're supposed to be prepared for it, which means more fervent in our Christianity. And if you're more fervent when Christ indeed comes, or when the temptation comes first, this Antichrist, you'll be more prepared to oppose it and more ready to meet Christ. <coughs> So when we say about the end of the world, it's not to scare people or to set some kind of date which we have to meet, some deadline, but to prepare people to withstand temptation and to meet Christ. And that's the state in which the church should always be in. That's the way it was in the time of the apostles. And wherever there's fervency among people, that's the way it is again. We are aware that the end is close. Yeah. You mentioned something about classical music and the bringing up of children. 
Yes. Yeah. Why is classical music? There's some classical music that it that provokes essential emotions and and well, some some of the classical music like bolero or a lot of other stuff like that is. Well, there's some. There's different kinds of classical music, Absolutely. of course. There are some which are, especially as we get into more modern times, it becomes more and more sensual and more and more anarchic. There is principles which belong more to the 20th century. The basic classical music is the classical novel, the 19th century the classical music of the 17th, 18th, 19th century. That earlier classical period is what I'm speaking about more specifically. Later on, there are fewer and fewer pieces that have that character of being able to refine them. The ones that are sort of more crude and sensual, those are the ones to listen to. I mean, the great composers like Bach and Handel and Mozart, in the 19th century composers, the many refined things in you know, Tchaikovsky and other composers, like Verdi, for example. There's some that are dangerous, perhaps, or too sensual, something like that. Yeah, but in my class, they said something about Liszt, Liszt's work, and well, his stuff is really well, sensual. Like well, so, there are different kinds of sensuality. And compared to what we have now, there's nothing in listening to essential. sensual. That's right. It's very refined compared to what we have now. So it's better to listen to that than an antidote against some of the things that are going on today. Because when they mention sensuality in connection with someone like that, it's not the same thing that you think of today. It doesn't directly evoke those emotions. It describes, perhaps, those emotions, just like a great novel will describe all kinds of passions. It does so with the purpose of your getting acquainted with them, seeing what they are. It's like you can even read a novel and not have to go through some terrible experience in life if you read it seriously. You see what's the result of that kind of passion. <laughs>